It's April 4th, 2018. Tonight we're going to be talking about how to motivate your child. I actually expected a, a, a lot of turnout, and we have a pretty good turnout tonight. I think it's one of the things that parents are probably most curious about is how can I light a fire or motivate my child, light a fire underneath or motivate my child toward a, toward a healthier direction. At the outset, I, I want to say this is not a bait and switch webinar where I'm not going to talk about it. I absolutely, absolutely am going to talk about ways in which we can encourage, facilitate, foster change in our children and, and motivation. I'm going to talk, of, of course, about some of the, the psychology around that and, and where it can become a problem. Um, but, but it's also important to understand that this is not a, a simple cause and effect relationship. You know, part of the, the, the foundation and part of the foundation that can have in it some problems is this idea simply that what I do has a simple cause and effect relationship with my child. And that kind of thinking and the, the, the dynamic that comes out of that becomes in itself more important and critical, a bigger problem than any of the thing that you do around it. So because this phase of life for, for adolescents and young adults is about individuation. So I'm going to talk about some tools, some skills and principles, but I'm going to, at the beginning and at the end, draw a line around the idea that it's not a simple cause and effect relationship. If we reduce it to that, then everything else breaks down. So the first question is that parents have, parents ask a lot of questions about motivation. Is, you know, is he motivated, is she motivated? Is this coming from an intrinsic place? Is this coming because uh, there, there's a lot of boundaries, there's a lot of carrots and sticks that are being thrown at my child? And, and they wanna know, you know, is this simple, simple behavior? Is this just a behavioral problem? Is it a mental health problem? The first concept that I want to share with you tonight is this idea that it's all the same in, in some respects. It's, you know, mental health is a continuum. And I think sometimes we think of it as this simple binary that you're either mentally healthy or mentally ill. When in fact it's a continuum with extremes at the end and we're all somewhere in the middle. And so the choices, the behavioral choices that somebody makes really from a therapeutic perspective, for the most part, I see through the lens of psychology and therapy. And when somebody's making choices, then they become a pattern of choices and the style of their choices are consistent and they often become hab habitual, habit uh, they become habits, then it forms into a diagnosis. So the line that we think about between mental health and mental illness is a much blurrier, wider line than the way that most people think about it. The idea that it's developmental. Developmental psychology says that people move through stages that are qualitatively different. That a, an eight-year-old is not a young adult, right? They're not just a, a, a it's not a, qu a quantitative difference. That there are qualities that distinguish them and that, that you go through stages. And that you can get stuck on stages, you can fixate on stages, you can have issues in certain stages that become themes and problems in your life, but it, 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 people change over time. One of my biggest pet peeves when thinking about children is this idea that, that we don't, for example, give a, a, an effort trophy to young children. Of course, in the early phases of participation, we're going to reward participation. And then as children grow up, right, we, we change our response because they're qualitatively different. And so we want to think about what we're rewarding and is it appropriate for the develop, developmental stage. It wouldn't be appropriate, for example, for the fifth year in, in Little League to be giving everybody rewards for participation. Then it's okay to have first place trophies. Right? It can be appropriate. And, and, and I think some people miss that point. And they simply reduce, they think that eight-year-olds are like little adults, and they're not. Is it organic? I mean, is it intrinsic to the person, their level of motivation? Or is it systemic? I, I think when I think about this question, and I get asked about it all the time from parents, here's where I come from. I think sometimes it gives us comfort to 
think about our child in terms of an organic problem. You know, it's, it's a brain disorder, right? It's their genetics. They were born with it. And there's, of course, truth to that. There are tendencies, proclivities. There, there's, there, people are inclined in certain ways. That's absolutely true in, in almost all areas of psychology. We could make that argument successfully. And there's the systemic issues, right? The, 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 the primary gain of a certain behavior is to reduce anxiety. The secondary gain of a behavior is the reward and attention that it gets in the system that I'm at, whether it be school or family or any relationship. So I might bite my fingernails to simply focus on something to reduce my anxiety. In essence, that's a, a, just a person problem. But if I get attention from my father or mother for biting my nails, then you start to talk about the secondary gain. And for me, what I say to parents oftentimes, the most important thing really to focus on, the thing that you have control over, is the systemic contribution to an issue. And so while somebody will ask me about how much I think that heredity or, or uh, the, the organicity has to do with a specific behavior or, or situation with a child diagnosis, and my response is some for sure, but my work with parents, my work with families is to focus on what you can't control. And in, in some respects, you can't control that. Now, if it requires medication, if medication could benefit, if medication could get them on a, on a level playing field, then of course that's an important question to ask. But, but it's, it's almost never helpful to think about it in terms of an either or, but, but both. And then what's the value in my focusing on the systemic, the family system's contribution to this? my own contribution to this, what's, what's my work in this, even if my child has certain predispositions, and he or she, of course, does. There's, there's a question about lazy, you know, is he or she just lazy? Um, what's the motive for doing this? Well, I'll say this, early on in, in diagnostics, the motivation might be intentional, but later, as it becomes a habit, it becomes much and much less conscious. Right? It becomes something that becomes a, a compulsion, if you will. That's what we think about when we think about addiction. And so when we therapists talk about the intention of a behavior, we are, are, are saying this is kind of where it started. And if we unpeel things, unravel things, we can get to the bottom of that. But one of the things we learn from people that are compulsive or, or addicted to certain things or behavior is we learn that they do them when they're happy. They do them when they're sad. They do them when they celebrate. They do them when they're anxious, right? And it becomes less and less conscious. We don't think about things as psychologists. We often don't think about things in terms of laziness necessarily. Yes, of course, they're, they're, it takes effort. It takes effort to do your therapeutic academic work, right? That's a part of human nature. But we oftentimes will talk about what are the motives? What's going on? E, you know, even in self-sabotage, even in failing miserably in several areas of life, there's still a payoff. I used to have students often write a paper said, what, what's the benefit of my depression? Right? It's part of what's behind what's the benefit of my destructive behaviors. That's an assignment we have. Because we want to say, what, what are you getting out of that? And, and the, the level of resistance that a client has to that, to that assignment, to being willing to do that, is, is to some extent a level of their denial. You know, depression, for example, tends to have people lower the bar, right? Depression has people come into your life and take over and take control and, and, and overcompensate for you, right? Overwork, over-involve themselves. It gets attention on and on and on. It, it's not the 100% of the motive, but, but to look at that, to be at least Honest with oneself about that is important. I think a lot of parents underestimate this idea of the function of the, sy the symptom, the function of the behavior. I have parents will, that will tell me, well, he said it in passing or she said it in passing. They didn't even know that what I was thinking, but this is what, what they're saying. I, I would ask parents, I would ask families, I do ask families, to consider the possibility that how you feel in reaction to your child is how 
consider the possibility that that's how it's supposed to make you feel. When you get a letter from your, your son or your daughter, for example, in wilderness, or you have a family therapy session, or you have a session period, for, for, for a moment, consider the possibility that the, the, the induction, the, the feeling that, that, that's being pulled out of you, consider the possibility that that's what the intended outcome of is that behavior. And if you do that, can you get yourself out of it? You know, I'm supposed to feel helpless. You know, when a child says, I give up, I'm not going to work. And a parent says, I feel helpless. That might be what they want you to feel. Or when you feel powerless to help your child, they might want you to feel powerless to maybe feel what they feel. In psychology, we call that projective identification. What I ask myself with clients is when I'm having a powerful feeling, hopelessness, frustration, anger, agitation, am I feeling something they're not feeling? Not, not, not overtly feeling, not, not consciously feeling? Is this possibly how they're feeling? So in the parent dynamic, taking a step back, looking at that can be helpful. Patterns, roles, and rules in families, you know, the, 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 how do they plug in? We talk about the identified patient all the time being the lightning rod, being the, the, the symptom bearer of the family, right? The, the children sometimes develop symptoms to get certain kinds of attention and resources into and onto the family so that they can get help, right? There's a lot of family therapy research that suggests that that symptom is a way for the family to get marital help, to the family to get to, to recalibrate rules, boundaries. Is that a possibility? Um, the, the pleasing of parents and peers. I, I think that can be um, something that, that we want to look at. Is that what they're doing? Is it, is it getting to the point where they're doing it to impress you? That's why I talk about with parents, being unimpressed. You know, what, what my work with students, clients in the field early on in their stay is, I, I kind of, and it's natural, it's not, it's not fake, it's not a technique, but I, I'm, I'm intentionally in the practice of not reacting, not reacting to the highs nor the lows, to, to the best that I can. So that it's about them and it's not about me. You don't want to be such a loud audience member, right? Such somebody from the crowd where they're paying attention to you. You want it to be about them. I think a lot of times when people ask about where's the motivation coming from, is it honest? Is it authentic? Are they acting? Are they faking it? In some ways, what they're asking is, does it have legs? I, I will tell you, if the children that I've worked with, if it was just about sincerity, sincerity, um, the success rate would be a, a lot steeper of a curve. I'm talking about tears and, and pain. Or they would be Academy Award winning potential actors and actresses. It's not about sincerity. It's not about necessarily is it authentic. It's about does it have legs? Is this likely to stay? Because one moment it can be authentic and honest, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the wherewithal to maintain that change in their life. So I think that's what the question is. And again, we, we move developmentally from more external, even in the program, early in the program, there's a lot of structure, a lot of emphasis on kind of going through certain steps and assignments. And later on, we, we, we back off and, 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 and are more, less directive in our approach. And that kind of mirrors the child's development at home, ideally. Here's some of the concepts that I, that, that I work with with parents. This first one is most important to me. The question that parents ask, ask me, and they ask it almost rhetorically, often rhetorically, why does he or she do this? In part, I'm supposed to be able to answer that question, right? I'm supposed to, as a therapist, see the child, see their story, Tell it to you in a way that makes sense, in a way that makes sense out of even seemingly inconsistent behaviors and responses. And another thing that that story is supposed to do is it's supposed to ask certain things of you or of the environment to give to the child to support. But oftentimes the why question is really just a, a, a shaming 
mechanism. In essence, why does she do this really means she's crazy or a bad person, per person or immature or, or what have you. They don't mean why. And so I just want you to be aware and careful of how you use that question and know that it really is your job over time to figure it out, to answer it. And then we as therapists with your children, that's part, and part of what we do is we kind of explain what's going on and why. Not at the conscious level, but at the unconscious level. So when we're describing motivations and reasons, we're, we're, they're not going around in life consciously making these decisions, but those are kind of the underlying themes, issues, motivations there. Other ways that we shame are saying, you know, he's being irrational, she's being irrational. In some context, everything they're doing makes sense. In some way of understanding and looking at the story, everything that they're doing makes sense. No matter how self-sabotaging it is. That's why I put this quote on here from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. If we could read the secret history of our enemies, we should find in each man's life sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. Right? That idea from, from Longfellow is if we can understand even the people that, that have hurt us or that we might despise, if we can understand what's going on for them, we would be moved to compassion. Not at the cost of our boundaries and of self-care and of self-protection, but it would not be a judgmental response or an angry response. It still, again, would need to be, in some in many cases, a courageously authentic, healthy position of self-care. Sometimes the, the labels that we give, you know, he's crazy, she's crazy, borderline narcissistic, bipolar, on and on and on. Yes, those diagnoses are helpful for we as therapists and for parents to understand the pattern of behavior, understand the pattern of defenses. Absolutely. They help us to predict certain behaviors and they suggest certain kinds of interventions or responses because they tend to be effective with, with, with certain diagnoses. That's all true. But also be careful of the fact that we also use those to, to shame, right? The, the, the word narcissism and borderline, those are kind of famously, uh, they come along with such a stigma. And we, we use narcissist in our society very, very casually. And what people don't understand that while a narcissist is off-putting or a borderline is hard to deal with, folks, those come from really significant, severe wounds, right? The narcissist is not an indulged child. The narcissist is a neglected child, emotionally. So it's, it, it's very important to understand and to, and to see that. He or she is being too sensitive, overreacting, those kinds of things. You know, the, 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 that's just us trying to shame them into a, a bandwidth that we can tolerate, right? We, we say to somebody, instead of owning our limitations to contain or hold space for somebody, we tell them how they're being wrong or bad or crazy or unacceptable so that they'll shrink themselves into a bandwidth that we can tolerate. And, 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 and even if we feel that way, right, they can sense that. That's why the project is us. That's why the project is developing capacity. The project is self-care. The project is me as, as a dad working on me. And out of that work comes courageous, authentic, assertive decisions and boundaries and so forth. He or she is being manipulative. This is one of my favorites or, or non-favorites, depending upon how you look at it. it it's, it's, it's not very important to think about in terms of how manipulative. I get described, children are described as manipulative, and, and some of them are incredibly clever. And incredibly fantastic gamesmen and gameswomen, right? They're really good at it. And they've navigated the ins and outs of, of certain personalities and dynamics, for sure. That is true. But it's not very important. The important thing is me finding out how not to respond to it. And again, there's something about he's a manipulator, he's manipulative, that, that, that distances myself from the solution in a very important way. Yes, addicts are manipulative. Yes, adolescents and young adults are often dishonest and manipulative. Absolutely true. But if that's my focus, 
that's the area that I, that I focus on. I really haven't focused on the work that I need to do, which is my own vulnerability, my own susceptibility to, to a certain kind of thing. I always used to say I was, I was, I'm very susceptible to insight, right? I'm a sucker for somebody that has wonderful aha moments. And so I could be vulnerable to people that were really therapy savvy and therapy wise. And, and I have to understand that and, and, and maintain that and work on that, be vigilant about that so that I can be present and see the other person and what's really going on. Lastly, the concept of function of the system or, or chain analysis and behavioral terms. What does this function serve? What is the reason that this makes sense and, and what is the context? And what are they getting out of it? What's the secondary game? What's the primary and the secondary game? That offers us compassion. It offers us a direction. It gives us, um, as, as parents and, and providers, it gives us some context on how to respond. And we don't respond punitively. We don't reduce everything to superficial behaviors. We focus on the root issues. All of those good things come out of that. The model for behavioral response is, is fairly simple. I read something, in fact, it was the book that I, that I did a, a review of just the other night, where she talked about this idea of behavioral, made behavioral kind of this, this, this simple idea, the simple focus. And it even said that the consequences are different than punishment. Folks, that's just a euphemism. That's a pop psychology idea. Punishment is a consequence. Punishment is what it is. It has assets and liabilities to it, but it's not bad or, or negative. It can be used uh, as an emotional reaction to somebody, a reactive emo emotion. That's one of its weaknesses. It doesn't tell people what to do. Punishment in this lower right quadrant here is a negative consequence for behavior that you want to decrease. In some ways, evoke can be that at times. It's not only that, we don't reduce it to just that, but it's aversive, right? It's aversive, and there are behaviors that we want to see stop. Think about self-harm. Think about drug usage. So I think we get held hostage as parents sometimes by this idea that when a child says, you're punishing me, yeah, sort of. I'm giving you an aversive consequence for behavior, but I don't need to be handcuffed by it and try to somehow explain it in such a way that it's not what it is. It is what it is. Reinforcement, positive reinforcement is a reward to behavior that you want to see increase. Going to the top left uh, of, the, of the, the screen if you're watching. Um, reinforcement is just encouraging something that you want to see continue. Giving money for good grades or freedom for somebody complying with certain responsibilities, right? Doing well, you get more. And we want to see that increase. Extinction is, is the removal of reinforcement leading to behavior increase. So, in other words, tantrum is the best example. If I have rewarded a tantrum, and I would bet everybody on this broadcast at times in their life have re rewarded a tantrum, somebody throwing a tantrum in their life, it is at times survival. Think about the grocery store, right? It's absolutely something that we do. The way to extinguish that is to remove that reward. And number one, we're going to see behavior increase. We call that an, ex an extinction burst. When the reward is removed, we're going to see initially an, an, an increase in that behavior. That's why it evokes. Sometimes it starts off and it gets worse. They're really just saying it's like it's like pulling the arm on a on a on a on a machine in Las Vegas, right? A slot machine. Random re randomly reinforced things when the reinforcement is removed, people just try more and try harder. So if my parents didn't respond to my tantrum, I'm going to make it louder and longer. And then negative reinforcement is a little bit clever. Um, the reward comes after the behavior decreases. Um, traffic ticket, for example, if you uh, go within the speed limit, then you don't get a ticket, right? So you kind of, it, it, it's, the, the, the benefit of, of, of negative reinforcement, the benefit of reinforcement is that it tells you what behavior to do. Negative reinforcement, it can sometimes, you know, what, what we do when we drive, we look for cops, right? We look for police. 
we don't just go the speed limit. We learn to, to avoid the punishment, the consequence, if you will. Punishment doesn't tell you what to do, and it can be used vindictively. And extinction, extinction is hard because it doesn't have immediate results, and the behavior initially through extinction bursts is going to increase, at least initially. Lastly, this concept that I talk about with permissive versus uh, strict parenting styles, controlling styles. I think one of the, the most common mistakes that I recognized early on was people putting strictness and control on the same continuum. Like strict and control is over here on the right hand, and on the left hand is permissive and non-controlling. What I learned after watching families early on in my career, most permissive families were controlling. But what did they do? They used emotional coercion, shame, guilt, right? Don't do what you're doing so dad is not sad or anxious or worried. You need to take care of that. And so what I learned is that one continuum is strict versus permissive. And the other continuum, I came up with the idea of controlling versus influential. So you can be any combination of the two, right? You can be controlling and permissive, controlling and strict, influential and permissive, or influential and strict. I will say this as clearly as I can. Human beings can adjust to fairly high levels of structure. I've seen it in our program for more than 20 years. What they don't respond well to is the control, the emotional coercion, the belief from the parent or anybody that what the child does is a reflection on them and therefore they're responsible for, for how the person feels about themselves as a parent or a therapist. That is hard to get out of. It's hard to thrive in. This is why so many times clients and students have said in our program, it was in some ways the freest I've ever felt. Because what they're saying is they got to feel what they wanted to feel. They got to hate me. They got to be mad at me. They got to think I was a stupid therapist, me and my staff. Right? They got to not like it. They got to not agree with it. The structures, the consequences, those weren't very negotiable in a lot of aspects. But the feelings and the thoughts, those were absolutely okay. And people can adjust to that. So it's a more complex matrix. And like I said, most permissive families, or excuse me, the most controlling families that I've met have also been permissive. Most controlling, emotionally coercive, guilting, shaming, moralizing, threatening, all of those things, intimidating, all those things, most of those families have been on the more permissive side of things. Um, like I said, the, the examples of you know, parenting with emotions, making it about the parent instead of the child. Um, I had a parent tell me that the closer my child gets to paying their own rent, the more insightful they seem to be. Right? The, the consequences kind of teach them that. And, 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 and it's okay. I mean, the reason... There's this question, there's this comment that I've heard parents and outpatient ther therapists and professionals say for years, that a person's got to want it. That's true, right? A person's got to want it. But part of our job as parents is creating a, a structure where it makes sense. If we enable and rescue, we're, you know, we're, we're not giving them a good reason to want it. We're actually helping them avoid the consequences. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing, though, because... You don't fire somebody necessarily. You don't fire an employee so that they'll stop drinking. They can keep drinking if they want to. You fire them because it's the best thing to do for your business, right? And then whether or not they stop drinking is up to them. And, and, and getting fired can be one of the things that contributes to somebody hitting bottom. Sending somebody to evoke doesn't fix them. It doesn't guarantee that they're motivated, but it becomes a part of you're here, this happened, you don't want to be here. What's the relationship you have between being here where you don't want to be, not having choices, not having freedom, right? Not having luxuries, creature comforts. What's the relationship between all of that and what was going on for you? Can you look at that? So sometimes we, 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 we raise the bottom by our interventions as parents. 
And at the end of the day, it's important to let go of the outcome on a fundamental level. In other words, we give the consequences, we give the rules, and we realize that they're doing their work even if the child chooses the punishment. Right? It's like, if I've used this example, uh, it's a simple example, fairly trivial. I can say to my children, you can have dessert if you eat all of your vegetables and all of your chicken. I can say that. And understanding that, that it works if I just follow the consequences. If they choose not to eat, it still works. If they choose not to finish their chicken and vegetables, if that's, that's the boundary, then it still works even if they choose not to eat, right? But what do most of us do? Most of us then try to get in after we get the, the consequences. We say things like, come on, Olivia. Do you want to be strong like dad? you want to be strong like your big brother, big sister? Olivia, eat your bread. Olivia, now. Okay, no ice cream, it's your favorite. Okay, I'm gonna eat all that, right? We, we get invested in the outcome instead of invested in the intervention and following through and being consistent in our boundaries. Um, be patient, it's a, it's, a, it's a long arc. And what you're trying to do is create a culture in your family of healthy, assertive, and clear boundaries with, with, with flexibility that comes from a place that's grounded, not from a place of fear or insecurity, right? And that we value the struggle and the suffering, that, that mistakes are how we all learn, and that detours and, and, and sidetracks are a part of it. That evoke is not a devastating, disastrous end, but it's a part of it. When we can embrace the, the, the imperfection of it all, we also get access to all the lessons and, and the valuable stuff that comes from every part of the journey. I statements, be careful. I talk about this idea that, that I, I think one of the mistakes that, that happens most commonly in therapeutic programming is that people learn communication skills, which are important and can be valuable for communication. But parents then think the way to motivate children is to tell them how upset you are in an assertive step-by-step -step way. And I, I've said this recently. I, I'm not to this point, but I'm nearly to the point where I want to tell parents, don't tell your children how you feel. I'm not to that point yet, but I'm nearly to that point. And the reason I say that I'm nearly to that point is because rarely, rarely do I find a parent telling the child how they feel except for to try to motivate the child, except for to try to get the child to do the thing that they want them to do so the child is not upset or in reverse so the parent is happy. And that's not the child's job to make you happy. That's your job. So be aware of what communication is and isn't for, and please don't use that tool to try to get people to do something, right? You're using it to be clear. You're using it to own your stuff. You're using it for the possibility of connection. You're using it sometimes to, to let go and become more conscious, right? But you're not using it ideally, optimally. You're not using it so that your child will then change his or her behavior so that you'll feel better. Don't be right. right. I've talked about that a lot in the past couple of months. In this work, you don't get to be right anymore. And I have a lot of parents that I've worked with over the, the, the years that they start to get some of the tools down, but they still try to convince the child that they're being rational, fair, reasonable, a loving parent on and on that's you trying to be right you get to do you and they get to think you're crazy stupid old-fashioned right unenlightened uninformed a control freak like they get to think and feel those things in this kind of way of thinking and the more you allow them to feel that again the greater the, the healthy attachment the greater the relationship in general the healthier the development. Um, don't debate, don't argue, don't lecture, don't give a consequence. Then on top of that, try to explain to them why it's okay and why they should feel it's okay and why they shouldn't be upset about it. It's okay to just say, I might be wrong. I don't know. You, you might be right. This could be not the way to do it. I don't know. And, and to know that you're enough. And again, if you create a, what, I, what I call the soup, if you create a soup in your family that everybody's getting 
cooked in and living in, where you are enough and what you feel matters and what they feel matters, it's everything. Then they go out in life knowing who they are and knowing that they don't have to be right. And they don't get easily pushed off of their, their, their center, their grounding, right? Then when people tell them what they should or shouldn't be doing, peer pressure, right? They're less susceptible to that. So it works for you and it works for them. Just be you and, and that's enough. And, and ideally, in my way of thinking, you're doing your work all along. And you're increasing in your, your awareness, your skill building. You're improving your critical thinking about parenting and about relationships. All of that's happening. You know, sometimes I don't ask the child. You know, when somebody's running around the track, we don't ask them about their commitment to cardiovascular fitness. Right? Practice can lead to a change. Right? Practice can lead to a habit. Practice is a discipline. I, I, I have a perspective enough as a therapist to realize that some things that the children that are struggling with that come to our program, no matter how well they do, they don't tend to have lasting change without more time. That's why we recommend so often aftercare. Well, we always recommend aftercare, but that's why we re recommend so often some kind of residential aftercare, right? That's an important part of it. So just know that sometimes the question is not about their internal absolute commitment to the concept, but whether or not <clears throat> you can see where they're at developmentally in their growth curve. And that's going to have to come from inside of you. The use of imperatives, you have to, you need to, you should, good, bad, right, and wrong. I would encourage you at least to practice for the next 20 years or so to eradicate those phrases from your language. In, in, the, in the hopes and intentions letter, instructions that we gave you where we talk about what words, phrases to use and not to use, I would just encourage you to try to incorporate those into your relationship skills always. Right? <clears throat> it's very rare that I will, I, I'm not perfect at it, but it's very rare that I'll ever say to my, use one of those words to my children. And I'm not, not teaching them, modeling for them morality or moral development. Those just are controlling words. And they're not actually true. You don't have to. And as a psychologist, psychologically minded person, I think of things in terms of mental health anyway. And thinking about things in terms of mental health, and that's kind of a pragmatic approach, it tends to induce less shame, induce more compassion and empathy. And what comes out of that kind of sensibility is a much healthier, much more effective contribution in many ways. Um, your children are much better at teaching it than they are living it. That sounds familiar to any of you. They are great at lecturing other children in the group. They are experts pretty quickly on other things for other people. But, but, but what we are practicing is the discipline of doing, the discipline of living. That's what, what's one of the valuable pieces of an experiential program, a nomadic primitive living small group model, is that dynamics, relationships get recreated that are similar to those dynamics at home, and children, young adults and adolescents get practice in that. Try to avoid teaching, lecturing, preaching, even at times cajoling kind of encouragement. Just simple, straightforward boundaries. Less is more. You know, I try to never give my children advice, especially as they grow older. And I will tell you what I have learned from my adult children. My adult children come to me more and more and more asking for whatever wisdom I might have on a certain subject, right? But there's something that, that blocks the, the differentiation, the individuation, when I'm always constantly doing these things. There's something that, that, that is threatening and intrusive about these things. So less is more in these areas. And lastly, make sure if you have a question, it's a question. And a statement is a statement. That's not like the example of the why question. If it's a question, ask it and try to answer it and listen to the answer. If it's a statement, make a statement, but don't confuse the two. When, when those messages are inconsistent, it can be crazy making for anybody. I used to have this slide for, for some of you that have been around a long time or seen some of the older broadcasts of the webinars. 
I used to have this slide at the end of every single webinar for the first couple of years because when I was teaching and talking, I would have parents write me saying, I feel so horrible. And that was, of course, not my intention. So I learned quickly, like, it's not a simple cause and effect. You can do what you can do, and that's all you can do. It's the serenity prayer of Codependence Anonymous and Al-Anon, which is, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the people, places, and things I cannot change, the courage to change myself, and the wisdom to know the difference. Right? What can we control? What can't we control? And, and, and remembering that focus. The take-homes. I talked extensively about the problem of cause and effect thinking. The parent filter. The parent filter is where you start to think about, you start to run things through the adult mind in you. You don't take what your child says at face value. I don't. But you try to hear what's underneath it and behind it. And, and the job isn't to agree with, condone, give your child everything that they want or ask for. But the job is to do your best to try to support them by giving them what you think they need to move forward. And, and yes, you listen and you listen and you listen. But you learn to interpret. You learn to see with a kind of x-ray vision. You don't always share that with them, right? That can be intrusive. But you see the deeper process going on. That's the parent filter. Finding, discovering, and retaining your center. That's why I go to therapy myself, is that, that, that practice, that discipline of going back and finding myself and being with somebody who can find me week after week after week. Seeing them versus proving to them that you hear them, right? When I hear parents say, I want them to feel heard. Well, well you can't make that happen, but you can't hear them, right? You can't see them. And you can, you can always improve and develop that skill. But if the goal is to make them feel loved, to make them feel not abandoned, to make them feel, doesn't matter how that sentence ends, that's not your business. It's not your job to get people to trust you. It's your job to be honest. And there is a psychological line between those two that's important in relationships. One is about me and what I can't control and demands and requires courage and work. And the other one is outside of my locus of control, outside of my capacity to control. And the minute that I focus on trying to get somebody to think and feel a certain way, I violated the boundary. It's all mental health. And we're all on the continuum, right? I hear sometimes about the horrendous things that go on in our society. And I hear people say, you know, not all violent offenders or, 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 or we have so many shootings in our, in our culture these days that I, I guess I can make reference to that. But I have people say, you know, they're not, not mentally ill. And my response is, of course they are. It's actually one of the measures of mental illness. But I think we think of mental illness as like a psychosis, like crazy, 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 hearing voices. That's psychotic. But mental illness is as simple as an anxiety disorder. Uh, an adjustment disorder, depression or dysthymia, which is low-grade depression, right? Substance abuse disorder. All of those are, from a therapist's perspective, those are in the diagnostic manual of mental health issues. Like I said, what addiction tells us about mental, excuse me, what addiction tells us about motivation, folks, even though we'll describe to you the function of the system, the function of the symptom, excuse me, kind of how it fits, What's it, what's it feeding? Eventually, the addicted person, and I, you can expand that to, to the other mental health, mental illness categories, doesn't have the same kind of conscious choice that we're describing. They use, you know, addicts use when they're happy, when they're sad, when they celebrate, when they're depressed. And then lastly, the boundaries, it's the same work, it teaches the same lesson whether or not the child responds in the way that you would like them to or not. And, and learning to detach from the outcome is an important piece of psychological work in, in the boundary work with you. All right, I'm happy to take any live questions that have come in. How do I motivate my child to move toward more positive behavior, staying away from friends that they know are not good? 
influences that can lead back to drugs. My son recently ran into another student who was in a vogue with him and has unfortunately gone back to bad habits and is now inviting my son over to his house. I'm trying everything possible to avoid this saying I'm busy and can't drive him. I need his help. I want him to realize it's not a good choice. Great question. Really leads it. Don't worry about him realizing it's a good choice. You can just set the boundary. Children learn from the outside in early on. And until he has a strong sense of it, you are allowed, I give you, it's kind of psychological, psychological permission, you're allowed to say no and not have a really perfect reason and not be right. Just I'm not comfortable with it. So, and I think a lot of parents have the same question. How can I get them to want it? How can I get them to subscribe to see it? That's not the work. I had a, a mother of a young child say to me some time ago that her son does the chores. He was eight or nine, did the chores, but didn't see the, the value of, of housework and the contribution it made to the family. And I said, that's not his job to see. He'll get that eventually. But for now, you can just make it simple behavioral. So my response is, let go of him getting it for now and just do the behavior. You can also, I mean, I'm not telling you what to do in terms of, if you wanted to, you could say, well, I'm going to let him figure it out himself and see if he fails. You're allowed to do that too. But if the goal, if you're not comfortable with him, if you're not supporting him, if you think he can't get it yet, you're allowed to kind of be his prefrontal cortex until you don't want to be, right? You're allowed to set boundaries. But, but definitely do your best to let go of him trying to get it or trying to somehow engineer that he subscribe to the idea that you know to be true. That's pretty obvious. Next question, on a behaviorism side, these seem in extrinsic rewards versus intrinsic reward. What are the appropriate if the goal is to build internal motivation? Yeah, you, as they move on developmentally, you, you take a step back. You let natural, excuse me, natural and logical, logical consequences of life kind of do the work for you, right? But remember, I just want to say, children develop internal structure from the external structure. And the trap for many of us, including me, is to try to get them to think like us. We have this, this playful thing that we say affectionately in, in our house when we talk about children that are under the age of 25. We call them half-brainers. Right? They don't have the prefrontal cortex fully developed. The decision-making, the, the ability to anticipate consequences. So we're going to be that. And, and we, we give them choices more and more as they get older and relative to how they do with previous responsibilities. And we value the mistakes as much as we do the successes. Ideally, optimally, I'm, I'm saying. I don't always do all of this, of course. So, yeah, it's okay, especially if your child is developmentally delayed, if your child is acting like a 12-year-old, but they're 17, you can kind of treat them like a 12-year-old. It's appropriate to treat them like a 12-year-old. But the, the, the temptation, right, the intoxication for most of us is we hope that they'll just get it, that we can somehow talk them into it, get them to want it, get them to be internally motivated so that, and here's my premise, so that we don't have to do the hard work of boundaries because that's the hard stuff. If I can get my child to subscribe to the idea, the concept, the value, then I don't have to do the hard work of boundary setting and maintenance. They'll just want to do it. Then there's no fight. Then there's no battle. Then they're not upset. Then they're not holding me hostage. On and on and on. Can you please clarify, clarify the running around the track versus asking about a belief? It's the idea that you fake it till you make it. That when your child is doing a lot of work, I just value that. I, and again, I have the adult filter, the, the, the parent filter, the, the therapist filter that I can say, I just know from experience that three weeks of running around the track doesn't make somebody capable of running a marathon, which, which life is in this analogy. So we need a, you know, your child's going to need some more exoskeleton, external structure, right? Some scaffolding that you're going to provide through them through either stuff that you do at home or through therapeutic placement. And it just takes time for behavior to become internalized and a discipline. And then something even that, that they 
they taste the sweetness of, of the idea that, you know, the virtue is its own reward. It takes time. That's what I mean by that. Fake it till you make it and don't take a constant temperature about have they bought into it. Just know that it takes more time. Our son never wanted to learn to bust a fire. To this day, it, it bothers me and I tend to extrapolate present avoidant behaviors to this choice. What was his motivation? Did he want to rebel against us sending him to Willis? It's a good question. It could be that. It could be that he was afraid of failure and the best way to kind of not do a failure is to not try. It could be uh, of punishing you. It could be that he knew how much you or we or somebody was attached to it. And so the one way he was going to make you fail or make us fail was to not do it. I don't know the specific answer to the question, but those are examples of answers where it makes sense. And in psychology, in some contexts, everything makes sense, even the things that seem the craziest. Can you give an example of keeping statements, statements and questions, questions? Um, why did you do that versus I don't like that you did that? I'm not okay with that. Right? That's an example of you're asking why did you do that, but you really mean I don't like it and I'm not okay with it. Um, or when you say to your child, I think you're doing this because you're mad at me. Instead of saying, here's my thought, I'm just wondering, are you mad? And I really want to know the answer. It's, that's more important than the statement. And so when we, when we ask questions that are really expressive of what we're feeling, wanting, thinking, believing, and the question is a ruse, I always know this. It was like when I asked my son when he, when he I got feedback from somebody in the neighborhood when he, was a, when he was a young boy that he had bullied somebody in the neighborhood that was smaller than him. And I asked him the question. I was really embarrassed. I was really angry. And I said to him, did, you do, did that make you feel big to bully this kid? That, that, was, no, that was no question. There was no answer that I was going to. He actually said yes. And then I just got more mad. <laughs> I, wasn't, I, didn't, I wasn't looking for information. I was just angry. But I was so upregulated, so elevated that I, I wasn't thinking rationally. And, and so I know questions are questions when people listen to the answers. And the answers are somewhat satisfying. But when questions are just invitations to a debate about who's right or who's wrong, they're not really questions. That's what I mean by that. And statements, I think we use statements as uh, can be replaced with questions Sometimes not as often as the other way around, but it's just asking someone how they feel or what they think or what's going on instead of telling them, instead of analyzing them and being right about it. How do I not, how do I, how do I handle my child not minding me? I tell my son he can't do something, setting boundaries, and he won't mind me. What should I do? How do I handle this? Well, he doesn't have to mind you, first of all. So. Um, you, that, even that statement, like, uh, it says, if I tell my son, he won't mind me, what should I do? Oh, you didn't say that. Okay. My, my, my mistake. Um, <laughs> go to therapy, you know, go to a place that you can take care of yourself so that his minding you isn't your source of serenity or not, right? That has to be from you and it takes a lot of work and especially when people have behavioral problems looking at the dynamics being understanding what's going on um, is important really important and it takes an outsider to do that at times um, <clears throat> and, and know that some kids are just committed to you losing that's the game you're going to lose so it, it's what I say often which is in life in relationships in some circumstances you do not get to win. You just get to choose how to lose. So you have the consequences. You have the limits. And then you decide if it's a, if it's a battle or a war. Like you don't want to fight every battle. And so you, you've got to kind of figure And again, I think that takes, for me, a dialogue with a therapist, a dialogue with a sponsor, a dialogue with somebody that can offer me perspective. Right? It takes a dialogue kind of sort that out and develop my, my critical thinking around all of that. 
how do we assess the fine line between healthy engagement and unhealthy disengagement? Huh, carefully. Um, and uh, it's okay to do it if you are over-involved or over-identified. It's okay to do it, to go through what Harriet Lerner says is an obnoxious phase. You don't have to do it flawlessly and perfectly. You'll find your balance, right? But again, talking with somebody, sorting it out, having that discipline in your life, asking questions, getting perspective, all of that. It's, it, folks, it, it is what I do in therapy for myself. Sometimes I do it with regard to my clients. Sometimes I do it with, with regard to my wife or my children or other people in my life. But I need, I need to work with somebody around this, right? So it, it, it happens for me in relationship with a, a therapeutic other, which is my therapist. And it's okay to not do it perfectly and to give yourself a little wiggle room. All right, folks. Thank you for all the questions and participation. It's fantastic. Uh, we would like all families to attend six 12-step support groups, so some combination of Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous. You can go to their websites to find meetings in your area. Also, tsunami.org is a place you can go for resources, affordable uh, resources and classes in your area. Uh, on social media, you can listen to all of these on the podcast app on your iPhone. Just go there and search for Evoke Therapy Programs and subscribe to our channel there. And then you can scroll through all of them and download them so you can listen to them when you're offline. If you have an Android device, you can download the SoundCloud app and do the same thing. Or you can go to a computer and, and go to soundcloud.com. On Twitter and Instagram, find us at Evoke Therapy. Facebook, search Evoke Therapy Programs. You can go to the Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook to participate, learn about an organization to help people that can't afford therapy. My new content on our blog. Uh, my book is available on Amazon right now because it's out of stock in the warehouse. You can go to, to this button here that I pointed on the slide. It's the paperback option. And you can buy it from Evoke Therapy Programs there if you need a copy for yourself or, or somebody else. Uh, you can also buy an Audible version through Amazon or a Kindle version. Uh, the next workshop will be April 21st, 22nd at Entrada. If you can and you're able, we want all current families to go to a workshop. Multifamily, experiential, educational. You can combine this with a field visit if your therapist says it's the right time. If you want to do deeper work, you can come to one of our Finding You workshops out of Park City. Wonderful, nurturing, compassionate, mindful, a real deep dive into your own issues. So if you want a therapy accelerator or a therapy springboard, you can do that. I'm also going to be announcing for the first time Finding You 2, number two. I've had many people request a follow-up to their Finding You. So if you've been to a Finding You, we're going to be sending out a mass email soon to see if you're interested in giving some possible dates um, to see if we have enough people that can and want to schedule the same time so we can do a, a Finding You too. So there are the dates for Finding You. The next one is May 2nd through 5th. You can also schedule a private family intensive. If you are a professional listening to this, because we have professionals listen to this, we have professional workshops for your own work, for your own personal growth in the context of being a professional. The next women's uh, group, professional group, is May 20th through 22nd. The next opening for the men's group, the May group is already filled, is June 10th through 12th. You can go to our website or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Upcoming parent support groups, New York City on April 23rd, that's Monday. Seattle on June 2nd, coming soon in uh, Denver and in the Bay Area. Email Andrea at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. Pursuits trips for families or young adults who want a reconnection or sober fun or something therapy light. Um, and I think that's all for tonight. I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, the hero's journey. That's next Thursday, April 12th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. The Hero's Journey next Thursday evening. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us. For and on behalf of your children, thank you for showing up and making this a project of yours, your, your own work, your own project. It's one of the greatest gifts you can give to your child. Take care, folks. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.